Good morning, Lake Forest. It's good to be with you this morning. Would you read this verse with me? It's our theme verse for this series. Uh, As it pops up here on the screen, would you read this with me? God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to His eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible in this verse is teaching us uh, here in the middle of this series that we're doing on five reasons to quit church. It is teaching us that the church is to make known the wisdom of God that is seen in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in fact, this is God's eternal purpose. That's what this verse is telling us. Some time ago, I had a man come into my office, and I always have people come in, and especially one of the things that gets my heart excited about is when they want to come in and they want to talk about their marriage, and they want to talk about how to get their marriage healthier. And so this guy called, and he said he wanted to talk with me about his marriage and wanted to get my advice and my help in helping his marriage work through some hard places of conflict. So as our time went on, over and over and over, I heard of all the ways that he believed his wife needed to change. And so if she would just do this or if she would just do that, then our marriage would be okay, and it'd be wonderful. And so all kinds of things that I heard that she was doing wrong, all the things that she wasn't doing right, and then the biggest surprise of all came to me when he looked at me and said, now the reason I'm asking for time with you is I believe our best plan here is if you would call my wife and you would invite her in and let her know the things that she's doing wrong and help her to fix these. And on the other thing is you can't let her know that I told you to call her. <laughs> True story. I'm telling you, I earn every dime that you guys pay me. And so when I get stuff like that, and so could you imagine how that phone call would have gone? Hi. Hi. This is your pastor. I was just sitting in my office, and the Lord told me that you're messing up your marriage. And I think that the reason your marriage is messed up is because of all the things you're doing wrong. And as your pastor, I need for you to come in, sit with me, and let's talk about how you can get your marriage right. Yeah, thankfully, I went to seminary, and I took the common sense theology class, and so I didn't make this phone call. True story, though. So I decided I got a better plan. Well, sir, your wife is not here, and I am not going to call her and invite her in here. So let's just work what we we have in here. We have you. (laughs) So let's just talk about how we can pay attention to what you've done and what you've not done. You see, you made a commitment to your wife some time ago. You made a vow to her. Your commitment, your vow was that you would love her in sickness and in health. You would love her in richer or poor. You would love her better or worse till death do you part. So how will you love your wife even if she never changes? That's my question for you. You see, the church is part of God's eternal purpose. And it's interesting in Scripture, the number one analogy for God and his relationship with people and God's relationship with the church is this picture of marriage. We can list off the failures of the church, its historical failures, all the ways that the church has hurt us. The church is not perfect. It's not even close to being perfect. But this Lent season, we are looking at why we might be tempted to give up on church, ways that we blame church, and rightly so in looking at all those things, but yet ultimately in the end, reasons why we shouldn't quit church. The church is the sum total of everyone that is following Jesus. That's what the church is. It's not a building. It's not any one particular denomination. But the church is the sum total of anyone who has chosen to follow Christ. In other words, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you are the church. So what if instead of saying, I don't like the church, the church needs to get this and that fixed, what if we said, each of us, our part of the church. We said, my part of the church is going to be different. Even if other parts don't change, my part is going to be different. That's the vow that I have made. My part of the church will look more like what God intended it to look like. Yes, the church is far from perfect, and it needs some changes, and I'm going to let those changes begin right here with me, the church. 
And if you're here today and you're not following Christ, you've not made that decision, or you're a spiritual explorer, or you're just a skeptic, I want you to know there's always room right here in this body for you to come to worship, to be a part of this community. And if you ever come to a place where you trust Jesus just a little bit more than not trusting him at all, and you make the decision that, yes, I want to place him in my life, I want him to be the center of my life, then you, too, become the church. And I pray that if you do make that decision, then you'd make a commitment to making your part of the church different. And that the church will look different, and it look like what God would want it to look like in you. During Lent, there are a lot of us moving through this Lent season, and we give up things during Lent. A lot of things that I watch people give up are things that they really tend to crave more than other things. Some people give up chocolate, they give up caffeine, they give up coffee, an addiction, a bad habit, or just an attitude that they uh, prefer to sit in over other attitudes. One of the things that the Lent season does is it helps you to pay attention to things that you crave, things you desire, and you're willing to sacrifice those things in order to get a little bit more in touch with the things that Jesus sacrificed, the things he gave up when he went to the cross. But as you do that, there's a tendency as well to think that all the things that you crave, all the things that you desire are wrong. But I want you to notice this morning a couple of things that I believe we all crave, that I believe God intended for us to crave, and I hope that you will never give up these two cravings. The first craving that I believe we all have is the craving for unity. We yearn for unity. We want togetherness, not chaos, and I believe that is God-given. We don't strive and yearn and long for unity just because it's woven into the fabric of our being. We strive and long for it because it is woven into God himself. In all that he is, in God's heart and God's personhood, he longs for unity as well. There's this fancy word that the church uses to describe God, and it's actually a word that's never found in the Scriptures at all, but the, the idea of it is all around the Scriptures, and it's this word called Trinity. Trinity means that God is one in essence, but yet he is three in person. God's essence is simply the nature of God, the stuff that makes God who he is. He is one in essence. He is one in person, in purpose. Yet everything in him moves and exists as one essence, as one purpose, Deuteronomy 6 tells us, O hear, O Israel, our Lord, our God, the Lord is one. But while God is one in essence, He is one in purpose, God is also three in persons. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, there is God the Holy Spirit, all three existing in one essence, in one purpose, yet three different persons. Genesis 1.26 tells us, God said, let us, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, create man in our, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, image in our, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, likeness. And so part of that, what you've got to see there is every time that you crave and you desire unity, you are expressing and you are reflecting the image of God. The one that made me also want unity and long for unity. Whenever you want unity, whenever you want cohesiveness in your family, in your marriage, in a dating relationship, in the office, in the locker room, on a team, in the classroom, whenever and wherever you are fighting for unity, that is a God-given desire. And that is good. You are reflecting the image of God. You see, we have a lot of families that are part of Lake Forest. We have uh, single families. We have blended families. We have all sorts of families. And a lot of those families sit in my office asking me, how do we get our whole family on the same page? It just works better if we're all on the same page. I want our family to be on the same page and moving in the same direction. One of the things I hear in churches all the time, we need to be unified. The church has to be unified, to be one mind, one purpose, and that is good. That is part of God's being. That is exactly what he has given us and the creating us in his image. We even understand this at a very early age. Children, from er very early on, understand this concept of unity. 
and being on the same page. And they actually tried to cause dissonance to divide and conquer their parents. Dad, mom said it was okay if I did so-and-so if it was okay with you. Great. I love that idea when they've never even talked to mom. And so then they go back to mom. Mom, dad said he's great with me doing so-and-so. And And that's wonderful until mom comes after me. And she's furious because I've given permission for so-and-so. And And I thought she was on the same page. But our kids understand in order for them to achieve and accomplish things, they got to get parents on their same page. And this unity piece is part of what they go after. The man that sat in my office, he wanted unity in his marriage. He just believed the only way to get it was for me to call his wife. See, I have kids and you guys setting me up with people trying to get me in trouble. But unity in marriage, we have to see that unity in marriage, it is vital. In Genesis 2, 24, it says this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. For the whole purpose of unity, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So this image, again, of two becoming one, and actually when they marry before God, it is three becoming one. The Trinity portrayed again. Thousands of couples walking down the aisle every year to experience and desire this oneness. That desire for unity from very early on, it is good. It is very good. It is from God himself. Yet one of the greatest reasons that we see people quit church is because they see the church as a people who can't be unified on anything. You guys are supposed to love each other. You're supposed to be unified. But all I ever see is this denominational splits, these theology splits, all these different kinds of things. But yet this desire for unity sits there. But then there's a second craving. There's a second craving that we all have that I believe is God-given to each of us, and it's the craving for diversity. It's also rooted in the Trinity. The three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all in one accord, all one essence, all moving toward one purpose, but yet three different. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. The Father does things that the Spirit does not. The Son does things that the Father does not. The Spirit does things that the Son does not. They are different. They are unique, but yet they are one. They're one of a kind, yet they move together. Marriage should be one of the greatest illustrations of that image. I am uniquely male. And my smoking hot wife, Virginia Boogity Boogity, is uniquely female. And I'm unique. I am one of a kind. And I am dead when I get home from making the comment I just did. But I am (laughs) unique. I have a thumbprint. I have a certain laugh that no one else has. I have a certain look that no one else has. Thank you, Jesus. I have all these unique things, and so does my wife. We are very diverse, yet we work very hard every day to be in unity together. We crave diversity. We crave variety. Yet one of the biggest reasons that people leave the church is because when they become part of the church, it seems that the church just wants everyone to look and to act and to think the same way. You have to like the same type of music. You have to believe all the exact same things. You have to vote the same way. You have to take, have the same desires. You have to talk the same way. All of these things. And what you end up having seems to be this very interesting paradox. I crave unity, but also I crave diversity. So what do we do with these two cravings that God gives both of us? The rest of what I'm going to share with you actually comes from a sermon that our pastor Michael Flake up at Davison did at Davison last week. And so I thought, man, it'd be great for all of our body to hear how he explains this understanding between unity and diversity. And so I'm going to share it with you because I believe it's vital for all of us to hear some of what he wrote to our whole church and preached. But also, it's because he and I have one common purpose. We are unified, but yet we have different styles. We are made up differently. And so to hear the same sermon in a different way could show this piece of of having a unified diversity. 
Not to mention I had way too much going on these past few weeks and I couldn't get ahead of this sermon. And I thought that was a really creative way of saying to you that uh, I couldn't finish my sermon, so I just took his. (laughs) But in all seriousness, that's not the reason I did it. But here's some things that Michael Flake says to us. The church at its best is a unified diversity. In the earliest days of the church, with the earliest followers of Jesus, you have this guy named Peter. Peter is one of Jesus' best friends, and he really struggled with this whole thing of unified diversity. And if Peter struggled with this, there's no reason why we shouldn't struggle with it as well. Here's Peter's issue. Most of the Christians during that time were people who were Jewish. They were Jewish, and then they became Christ followers. They saw that their faith in Jesus was a completion of their Jewish heritage. But all of a sudden, there's a number of non-Jewish people. They're known as Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, then you are a Gentile. And these Gentiles wanted to follow Jesus as well. And so they began, inter- became interested in following Jesus. And you can read this story in the fifth book of the New Testament. It's a book called Acts. And it tells us the story of the first people that were called church. There's this Gentile, his name is Cornelius. That should be a very easy name for us in Lake Norman to remember. So Cornelius comes to Peter, and he says, I want to learn about this Jesus. And he sends some of his servants to Peter to ask, and this is what he says. The servants say to Peter, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. But Peter was really torn by this request. That doesn't make sense. I know that Jews can follow Jesus, but it doesn't make sense that Gentiles would want to follow Jesus and could even follow Jesus. Most people were saying that the Gentiles, they needed to become Jews first. And the only way that you could become a Jew is if you were circumcised, if you had a male in your household to be circumcised. So if you're a Gentile and you want to follow Jesus, then get the men in your family circumcised, let them walk it off, and then the whole family can follow Jesus. Because only Jewish people can follow Jesus. That's what most Christians during that time thought. They were coming to understand this concept of unified diversity, and it was hard. Unified diversity, it's a really difficult thing, and it can go wrong a lot of different ways. And when it goes wrong, it often tempts people just to quit church. One of the ways that it goes wrong, one of the biggest ways that unified diversity goes wrong is we seek uniformity as opposed to unity. And that's ultimately what this man who walked into my office wanted. He wanted everything to be the same. Perhaps you've experienced this firsthand, where you've seen a little C church or a group of Christians who all they wanted was uniformity instead of unity, and it left a really bad taste in your mouth because you didn't want to fit their mold. Or worse, it began to make you think that you couldn't actually follow Jesus the way that he wired you and the way he designed you. You see, there are some pockets of the church that truly do want cookie-cutter Christians. This is what some folks in the early church were trying to do. Great intentions, they wanted everyone to fit the same Jewish mold. And then it would be easy for the church to be unified because everybody would be the same. But that's unified diversity going wrong. A second way that it goes wrong is we become divisive in the midst of diversity. Obviously, divisive and diverse uh, are variants of the same root word. There's always a thin line between these two different things. Diversity is a struggle because our unity can't come from our sameness. We separate what is different, and so we just go ahead and we want to just do our own thing. The man in my office saw that the only solution to having unity was if his wife became like him. And then when she wouldn't become just like him, he got angry and it became divisive. And he wanted to just separate or he wanted me to just come in and make her just like him. I get it. I truly do. On this image of when 
unity can't happen, and we want it just and when divisiveness comes out. This summer, I'm going to be spending some time in Ireland, and one of our ministry partners is actually there in Northern Ireland right now, and he is making a difference. He is trying to make his part in the church be different. He is there studying between Catholic, the, the arguments between Catholics and Protestants in that region. And he understands that I want things to be different. And he's seen the divisiveness, the years and years of divisiveness between Catholics and Protestants and the bloodiness, the ugliness, the tragedy of all of this. You and I, we live right here in the American Southeast. We live in a legacy of divisiveness in the church. White Christians thought segregation would be a cleaner solution than experiencing the diversity of the church. We still live in that legacy today. We can't undo it. We can't ignore the wrongs of the church in history, but we can try to be different today. I have no doubt that most of us sitting in this room have struggled with instances of uniformity and divisiveness in the history of the church or uniformity and divisiveness in your own life, and you've paid a heavy price for somebody trying to go after those two things. Jesus tells us, they will know that you are my followers if you love one another, which means the opposite is true as well, isn't it? That they will question who your God truly is by the way you hate one another. And they will look at, the world knows that's not who God is. But if that's who you say God is and the way you hate each other, then I don't want anything to do with that God. You see, I come beside you as your pastor today, and I encourage you, don't let this struggle that, that's hurt become a wedge between you and God. I pray that you can see Christians, we are unified in our imperfections. We are unified in trying to forgive as others forgive us as well. And I ask you, don't confuse our behavior with who God truly is. You see, we are following Jesus, but it takes time to learn how to do that properly. And we make mistakes in the middle of that. But we've got to forgive and we've got to continue to move forward. If you are here today and you've not chosen to follow Jesus, and part of the reason you've not chosen to follow Jesus is because of the uniformity and the divisiveness that you've seen in the church, on behalf of the church, I just say, I am sorry. I am sorry that you've been hurt by that. But please don't get confused in that hurt with who God truly is. And so I want to give us this morning for the rest of our time some thoughts on how we can make our part of the church different. Your part, not everybody else's, but looking at your part. The church at its best is unified diversity. And Christians are unified by a commitment to Jesus. Now, that should have shocked you, that Christians are actually unified by a commitment to Jesus. What unifies the church are the people who follow Jesus, that we have a commitment to him. Galatians 3, 28, there's neither Jew, there's not Gentile, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male, there's no female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, there's room in the church. There's room in the church for both Jews and Gentiles, enslaved people, free people, men, women, standing together, worshiping together, leading together, being unified by their commitment to Jesus Christ. These are important cultural distinctions. They're biblical. They are Scripture. And Scripture says once you understand the power of the unity of Jesus Christ, the power of all of these distinctions, they begin to fade. I will worship different than some of my other family members in the church. I will worship different this morning. We've worshiped different this morning than our friends at uh, Grace down the, church, down the street, Grace Covenant, those at Life Fellowship, those at Journey Church, the Cove, Gethsemane Baptist, all worship differently than we worship. We are diverse in that, and I love it. But they have a deep passion for Jesus, and that's what unites us. But when my anger stirs, and I begin to think that they've got to become like me, 
that I won't like them, I won't uh, love them until they worship the way that I worship and think the way that I think, then I become divisive. But my commitment is to understand that they recognize and they love Jesus and the power of our differences begin to fade in light of that. A second reason that we are unified is in a few essentials. All Christians are unified by a few essentials. Beliefs that we have not made up, but have been around since the early church, the very beginning. These are not beliefs that we have the right to change, but they join us with followers who've come before us. We get a glimpse of this in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. I be- he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. He died and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will become to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Beliefs that I can't change, beliefs that are grounded in the early church that we embrace and links us together. Now imagine going to a community group for triangles. Now you can tell Michael Flake wrote this analogy, not me. You went to a community group for triangles. And all of a sudden, in that community group for triangles, in walks a rectangle. Rectangle. He says, hey, don't be so judgmental. I'm just a four-sided triangle. Now, you and I both know there's no such thing as a four-sided triangle. We have to have consistency on what we mean and define as a triangle. And that's what, some, what the Apostles' Creed does. It gives us a place where we can say we know who Jesus is. And this is what it means to follow him. And the Apostles' Creed gives us a lot of grace in being able to follow him in those ways. Third, Christians are unified by Jesus' mission. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The mission of the church is to be a witness to Jesus Christ, to every pocket and people all around the world. The mission of the church is to share God's love to every pocket of people all around the earth. We encourage people to become followers of Jesus. And as we treat them with kindness, whatever that they decide, whether they choose to decide to follow him or not, we still treat them with love and with great kindness. We meet the needs of people, whether they be spiritual or physical. Or we love people, and that points them to this one Jesus that we are committed to. Finally, Christians are diverse in everything else. This is why Peter says, when he finally makes it to Cornelius' house and realizes that following Jesus is not just for Jews, it's also for Gentiles, he says this, Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You see, Christians are not unified by singing the same songs. We aren't unified by speaking the same language, reading the same translations of the Bible. We aren't unified by coming from the same background or voting for the same people or having the same view of capitalism or going to the same kind of church or reading the same authors or choosing the same educational methods or having the same diet or receiving communion the same way or emphasizing the same parts of the body of the Bible. That's not how we are unified. Did you know that some Christians are tall? Some of them are short. Some are smart. Some are not as smart as those who are smart. Some are suspicious. Some are naive. Some are NC State fans. And some are Carolina fans. Some watch pro wrestling. And some live before TVs were even invented. And what unifies those Christians, what unifies the church, is Jesus Christ. God's only son who died and resurrected to give us abundant an everlasting life. God doesn't show favoritism because any person 
can come and receive Jesus as their life. The love of God is available to everyone, no matter how different they are than me. And we are each changed after we meet Jesus, not to look like one another, but to look like Jesus. Ephesians 3, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ's love is deep. It's deep enough to include both Peter and Cornelius, to include both Gethsemane Baptist and Lake Forest Church, high enough and long enough to empower the church to show kindness and hospitality to anyone, even if they don't follow Jesus. You see, the church has never totally figured out how this unified diversity thing works because our love is not yet as wide and deep and complete as Jesus' is. But if it's ever going to change, it's got to start right here. It's got to start with me, not me pointing at everybody else and saying, if they change, if they change, but it starts right here. I want things to be different. I want things to look like what the church is described in Revelation 7. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes. They were holding palm branches in their hands, and they all cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. What a beautiful picture of the church. A multitude of people, more than anybody could ever count. They come from every place, every language, every skin color, every background, and together they worship God with great joy. Can you imagine tasting that on earth? I believe every one of us crave for that picture. So we can sit and look all around us at the things that others need to do to change. But I want to leave you with a question to spark your own thinking about your own change. Where do you need God to expand your love to make it more like the love of Jesus? Is there a person in the church that you need to forgive for how they've hurt you? You can forgive them right now. You can go to them in person and ask their forgiveness. Or if that's inappropriate, you can forgive them right here in your own heart. Is there a place of divisiveness or forced uniformity in your life? Is there a person inside or outside the church that you need to reach out to and you need to show love to? Is there a group of people inside or outside the church that you need to reach out to, that you need to show love to? of people that you've said, I want them to be uniform, and then it becomes divisive. Do you need to ask God to expand your love for them? Can you imagine yourself worshiping God right beside them? That's the church. One day, if you decide to follow Jesus, one day as you follow Jesus and you commit to a unified diversity, then we will all be a part of an unaccountable multitude of unthinkable diversity united in worshiping God. That picture that we saw in Revelation happening right here on earth. I crave that, and I won't let that go because I believe that is exactly what God has put in every one of us. But for that to happen, we've got to allow Christ to change us, the church, individually. And the unique part of that is the only one who can change that is him as we keep following him. So let's turn to him as we pray. Lord Jesus, our desire is to be your church the way that you designed it, the way that you long for it to be, the way you want it to look. Oh, it's so easy just to point our fingers at others And to say, but if you just change them, 
But this morning, there's nobody else in the room but me. How would you change me? Teach me how to keep my vow to you, to love as you have loved me, to forgive as you have forgiven me, to give life as you have given life. Would your church become all that you long for it to be? Would you start right here with me? It's in your name I pray that. Amen. And we're going to read together these words as our benediction. Would you read them with me? May God the Father, who does not despise the broken spirit, give you a contrite heart. May Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the cross, heal you by his wounds. May the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, speak to you words of pardon and of peace. Amen.